So this week we're beginning a new section in our sermon series in John. We're going to be looking at the first five verses of a prayer that Jesus makes that continues right to the end of chapter 17. It comes at, this prayer comes at the conclusion of his teaching to his, his final teaching to his disciples and just before his betrayal and arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, this prayer is deep and significant. Some theologians have famously commented, no attempt to describe the prayer can give a just idea of its sublimity, its pathos, its touching yet exalted character, its tone at once of tenderness and triumphant expectation. Now, they actually tell me that some pastors in history, when they were preaching through John and they got to John 17, they wouldn't preach it, they would just read it because they felt that they just couldn't do justice to it. Now, um, Ryan and I, we're going to be going through it, and we know that we're not going to be able to do justice to it either, but with God's help, we hope to be able to do our best. Now, traditionally, this has been called the high priestly prayer, um, because in it, Jesus prays not just for his disciples, but for all believers from all time. And so he not only intercedes for all people in this way, like a high priest, but one of the themes of this prayer is sanctification, as he prays for the holiness of his own people that would be set apart to God alone. Now, this prayer is also unique because it is the longest recorded prayer that we have of Jesus by far. You know, in Luke especially, we read about Jesus praying all the time but he records very few of those prayers. Uh, we've seen Jesus pray just before he raised Re uh, Lazarus from the dead back in Matthew. And um, we also could think of his most famous prayer, where he said, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he prayed that in the Garden of Gethsemane, his most famous prayer. But you can see most of these prayers are just one or two sentences long. Now, some of you might say, well, what about the Lord's Prayer, which is in Matthew and Luke, and I'm sure that we're all familiar with it. Our Father, uh, in my, uh, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done as er on earth as it is in heaven, and I'm sure we all know how the prayer continues like that. The, the problem with this prayer is it really shouldn't be called the Lord's Prayer. It should be called the Disciples' Prayer, because Jesus didn't pray this, Right? He couldn't have prayed a prayer like this because in the prayer you pray, forgive us our debts. As Luke clarifies, forgive us our sins. Jesus never sinned. So this wasn't a personal prayer of Jesus. Instead, this was a, a prayer that he gave his disciples to teach them that they can pray like this. He, he started out to say, pray then like this. So it wasn't a personal prayer of Jesus, just a teaching method. That means that the prayer in our passage is by far the longest recorded prayer of, that we have of Jesus. Now, this prayer gives us an opportunity to engage in what I like to call holy eavesdropping, where we get to listen in on Jesus communing with his Father at a pivotal time in his ministry. From this prayer, we can learn what was important to Jesus at this really important moment. But we can also learn how to pray from this prayer, because um, as we listen in, we understand that Jesus intended that. We're supposed to be listening in so that we can learn. That doesn't mean it's not a genuine prayer. It is a genuine prayer of Christ. But um, like any good teacher, he uses this prayer even as an opportunity to further teach his disciples one last time before his betrayal. When I was teaching in China, I learned that they called things like this teachable moments, natural situations that present teachers just one more opportunity to further press home a lesson that you're trying to show them. Well, Jesus, in chapter 16, and actually before that, all through this final teaching to his disciples, has been trying to teach his disciples about how to pray. And so, he, he seizes this opportunity, this time of prayer, to pray one last time before them and to show them and, and teach them through how he prays in this critical moment. Now, Jesus' prayer can be divided into three sections. Actually, uh, the first section runs from verse 1 to 5, and there he is praying for himself. In 6 to 19, he is praying for the disciples, and in 20 to 26, he is praying for 
directly for us and all others who will come to belief after he's gone. Now, I want to just reread verses 1 to 5 right now so we can kind of refresh our memory as we're about to study these five verses together. Just as a reminder, it says this. Follow along with, in your Bibles, please. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you since you've given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given to him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So I just finished saying that this was a prayer of Jesus for himself. And we saw in it, he asks God to glorify him. Does that mean that this is a selfish prayer? Well, I think it becomes clear if we just take a moment to look at it, that's absolutely not the case. I mean, in verse 1, he's not being greedy or presumptuous when he's asking God to glorify him. In fact, verse 5 shows us he's only asking for the glory that was already his before. It says, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So he's only asking for the return of the glory that was rightfully his. But notice in verse 1, he gives the reason that he asked for this glory. He says, glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. And that's really important, because Jesus shows us an important principle about glory. It isn't meant to be kept for yourself. Glory is meant to be shared and be reflected back to God. In fact, when that's when glory becomes truly glorious. When we try to hoard it for ourselves, it diminishes. But when we give it back to God, when we give it to those who it's due, when we share glory, we don't get less as a result. In fact, it increases. Many of us have had bosses or, or co-workers who uh, try to take all the credit when things go well, and it's really difficult and frustrating to work with people that are selfish like that. But we've also had bosses or co-workers who freely share and give glory around with their team, and, and I think we respect them more as a result of that. Or imagine a coach who wins a coaching coach of the year. If he gets up in his speech and he just takes all the glory for himself, I think he would be diminished in our eyes a little bit. But when he talks about the team that made it possible for him to get this award, then we think more of him. God here is the ultimate example of the right use of glory. And this passage shows us that he, glory is freely shared and, and given back and forth among the persons of the Trinity. The Father and the Son glorify each other, as we see in these first five verses here. Now, the whole reason Jesus wants glory is so he can give it back to the Father. But that should kind of remind us of what he said back in John 13. He said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and now is God glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God also will glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. It's a little bit of a complicated verse, but I think we're getting the idea here that um, there's this, just this beautiful, constant interchange of glory and praise and love in the deity itself between all the persons of the Trinity. It's, it's really cool. And verse 5 shows us that this has been going on from eternity past. This is not something new. This has been going on a long time. But if this has been going on a long time, Why does Jesus ask to be glorified now? What's happening that he makes this prayer in this moment? Well, in verse 1, Jesus says, Father, the hour has come. Because of this hour, glorify your Son. That's why he's praying, because of this hour. Now, we've been reading about this hour all through John. We've been hearing about it. It, there's this hour that was coming, it was coming, it was coming, and then we reach John 12. Some, some uh, non-Jewish people come and they're looking to find Jesus, and Jesus declares, the hour has now come. This is the hour of salvation, not just for the Jewish people, but for the entire world. It was an hour that Jesus predicted all along, and he kept doing that so when the disciples would realize that he was in control. It's total sovereignty over this hour. This is God's timing. This is not a mistake. The disciples needed to hear that. They needed to have that reinforced again and again because they were about to see their Savior hung on a cross and they would wonder, God, are you really in control? But 
No, he was in control in that moment. It was an hour that they had, that was part of the redemptive plan of God before, etern- before creation. And Jesus talks about this hour not with dread, but triumphantly. In fact, this whole prayer in chapter 17 flows out of the last words that are recorded of Jesus' teaching in the very verse before that, in chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus said, just before he prayed, in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The whole prayer flows out of Jesus overcoming the world in this hour. The irony of this is that Jesus will be glorified through the most degrading and humiliating way known to people at that time to execute someone. And that irony mustn't be lost on us. To capture that irony in their minds, the early church used to say that that Jesus reigned from the tree. Now, um, They said tree referring to the cross because the cross is made out of wood, but they're specifically referencing that Old Testament curse that said anyone who dies on a tree is cursed. And so they recognize the curse of sin came upon Jesus on the cross, fulfilling that curse from the Old Testament in a way that no one had imagined at that time, that Jesus hung on a cross of wood and he was executed. But in that moment, he was exercising authority to redeem people to eternal life, even while he was apparently hanging helplessly on the cross, dying there, he reigned from the tree. Now, I think this thought of authority in the coming dark hour is exactly what we see Jesus continue with in his prayer in verse 2. He's he's going to explain how God has glorified him and how he's going to use the glory he's received to glorify God. That's what he's going to pray about here. In verse 2, the first way God has glorified him, we see right away. And, and he says, um, since you have given him authority over all flesh. Jesus has authority over all of humanity. In fact, this authority is something he's had even before creation. And it was given to Christ with a specific glorifying intent in mind. The purpose was so that he would use this glory to enact redemption. I mean, use this authority to enact redemption. And having this authority brings Christ glory. Now, that specific purpose of redemption is outlined exactly what he says next. See, he says... Um, In verse 2, and since you've given him authority over all flesh, why? To give eternal life. To give eternal life. So, um, not only does God give him authority over all humanity, he gives him the authority over all humanity so he can give people eternal life. Now, back in chapter 5, Jesus explained, for as the Father, let me get it there, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. This phrase, life in himself, means to be the source of life. And here, Jesus was given the authority and power to be the source of eternal life. And that glorifies him, because if anyone wants eternal life, they need to seek it through Christ. Now, Jesus Jesus, uh, finishes um, this chain of thought of glory at the end of the verse. To give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And so not only did he receive authority over humanity, authority to give and be the source of eternal life, but now he's given the glory of being given all those who will believe by the Father. So um, this is telling us that um, the Father is just lavishly generous to the Son. He's giving him all these things. He's glorifying him in all these ways. And we can notice that this eternal life isn't just given indiscriminately, but it's given to those whom the Father has given the Son. So it reminds us of the Father's sovereignty. Salvation is for those predestined to receive it by God's goodness to His Son. But the emphasis here is not God's sovereignty, but Christ's glory. Christ is being glorified in His authority, in being the source of eternal life, and in, in believers, us, who belong to him. We are rightly called Christians because we belong to Christ, and that glorifies Christ. And now, all of these sources of glory are the Father glorifying his Son, 
and all of them center around this hour of the cross. And uh, Jesus is going to complete the work of redemption in this hour and give the glory back to the Father. In verse 4, he's going to kind of complete that circle of glory and show how it finishes it. But first, he does this little aside in verse 3 that I think is really interesting and really amazing. Verse 3, he gives us a definition of eternal life. Now, if I were to ask you, define eternal life. If, if someone were to come up to you and say, oh, you believers, you think you have eternal life, what does that mean? How would you answer? What definition would you give? This is really important because this is the reward of our faith. What, how do we understand it? And do we understand it the same way as Jesus? Look what he says. I think he says something different than many of us would define it. He says, and this is eternal life, that they know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. See, first of all, this isn't an exhaustive definition of everything involving eternal life, but this is fundamental. It may not include everything, but eternal life is certainly not less than this. And if you're missing this in your definition, you are missing a fundamental aspect of eternal life. See, when we talk about eternal life, we tend to talk about longevity, living forever. Yet Jesus doesn't even mention that as part of his definition. Now, we have to remember, biblically, every soul continues on after death, right? The question isn't whether you continue on after death, but where you're going to be. It's about destination, heaven or hell. It's not about continuance. And so, if all, everyone, in that sense, eternally continues, that can't be the reward of our faith, can it? Because we were going to have that anyway. Eternal life is not about continuing on, after death. Eternal life is about knowing God and Christ. But here we need to recognize a nuance to how the Bible often uses the word knowing. I think we can best understand it in English if we look at the difference between knowing someone and knowing about someone. So for example, I know a lot of facts about Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, far more than I have any business knowing. I also know a fair bit about Matt Sundin, my favorite Maple Leaf. And I've watched interviews of Justin Bieber since he's claimed to be a Christian. I, I, I know about these people. I know about their marriages, their kids, their skills, major life events, things that they've shared. However, I don't really know them at all, do I? I've never met any one of them. I never will, I'm sure. I only know their public personas. What a difference uh, that is between how I know them and how I know my wife Anne and my kids. I know my family personally, intimately. I know their histories. I can often guess how they'll react to things. I, I don't just know about them. I know them because I have a relationship with them. It's not a set of sterile facts in my head, but a warm and vibrant living relationship. Having eternal life means knowing God not knowing theology, knowing facts about God. Having eternal life means having a relationship with God, living with him, knowing how he thinks, learning what he wants from me. You know, 1 Corinthians uh, 13 and 12, Paul was writing about um, heaven, and he says this, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. This is the knowing of eternal life. More than longevity, it points to a dynamic, intimate, and growing relationship with God. See, God is what makes heaven, heaven. Knowing him makes eternity good because he is good. I enjoy science fiction, and inevitably in some stories you meet the bored immortal who lives forever but is just sick of living. They've lived so long, they've seen it all, they wish they could die. Well, eternity for them has become an eternal monotony, but that is not so with eternal life. See, knowing God is never something you finish. He's an infinite being. You never get to the bottom of God. There's always more to learn. There's always a deeper understanding of his grace, of his love, of his power, of his wisdom, his knowledge. Knowing God is a limitless journey into the source of all goodness. There is nothing boring about that. And I wonder, as we describe this eternal life, 
Do you have it? Do you know God? Are you saved? Now, if this is something that you want for your life, it is received through Christ who God sent. That's why he says here that they know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. See, God sent Christ so that we could come to know him uh, through Christ. John 14, 6 and 7 has already told us, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Watch this. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Knowing Jesus is the way to knowing God. Jesus is the source of life, eternal life. So, here we understand that God sent Christ to give us the means to know him. He came and he died on the cross. He died for our sins. He suffered there so that if we will believe that he died for me, make it personal, and if we will repent of our sins and say, Jesus, I'm so thankful you died on the cross for me, we take him as our Lord, we will be saved, and we will know God forever. If this is something that you want for your life, I hope that you will ask another believer about it. Ask, find a believer. I'm sure they'd be, love to share with you more about the gospel and try to answer some of your questions that you might have. Now, as Jesus hinted at the work God gave him when he said uh, that he was sent by God, he's going to finish that thought in verse 4. He flows along and says, I glorified you on earth, having, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. See, God is glorified in the eyes of all of those who see what he planned and achieved in Christ. The coming hour would glorify God by revealing his heart and his character to the world. Now, he's also glorified, though, by Christ through Christ's obedience to the Father's earthly mission, that, that, that Jesus submitted himself and committed himself to obey the Father's will for his life. That brought glory to the Father. And, and Jesus did all of this in complete dependence upon God, as we've seen throughout John. The, the theologian Gary Burge said this, the essence of this sort of prayer is that Jesus is so utterly dependent on the Father, so oriented toward what the Father wills, so desiring that God be glorified through his living and working, that it has controlled every aspect of his life. God is glorified by Jesus' perfect obedience and dependence and in the very work that he finished on the cross. So we've seen God glorifying the Son, through the authority he gave him, through making him the source of eternal life, and through giving him all those who will believe. All these have been preparatory for the coming hour of the cross. And the Son is glorified by the Father, by going, glorifies the Father, sorry, by going when he was sent, by completing the work, and by letting people know God himself. And again, all of this glorifying finds its ultimate fulfillment in the cross as well. That's why in verse 5, Jesus continues and asks for the original glory to be restored to him. Look what he says. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Now, first of all, we can see that Jesus is directly claiming divinity in this passage. First of all, he existed before creation, and he shared the glory with the Father. He wasn't just glorified by the Father. He had the same glory as the Father. That's an amazing divine thing. Only God can say that. But maybe on a more direct uh, level here, we can see that um, the earth and his birth into the world as a baby in Bethlehem wasn't his beginning. He existed before that. He was pre-incarnate, but in the incarnation, that means when he became a human being, that was uh, 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 not the beginning, but that was for the purpose of the mission he was given. And in doing so, obviously, he had to set aside some of this glory and splendor that he had with God because now he has to ask for it back. So when he became human, in some sense, he emptied himself of some of that glory. And he's going to ask for it to be restored once he has finished the work and once he has uh, done what he's accomplished and returns back to heaven. That's what he's praying here. I think that Paul perfectly captures what Jesus is talking about in Philippians 2. There, um, he, he says, um, he writes, 
about Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So we've looked at how Christ had to ask for his glory to be restored that he had with Jesus before creation. Here, Paul writes about how he emptied himself, emptied himself of some of that glory. He did that so he could become a human being, born in the likeness of men and servant. Servant, why? Because he would further go down and humble himself, not just by emptying himself of that glory, but humble himself by dying on a cross. But here, this little passage continues. And, and it says, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In response to his accomplished work on the cross, God would restore his glory and all creation will acknowledge his value and worth and glorify him. In our passage where Jesus has been, pr been praying, this is exactly that same movement that Jesus has been praying about. See, we've seen that the Father and the Son glorify each other. What remains for us here is to understand how should we respond to this. As we learn this teaching, what does Jesus want us to do about this? Well, I think it's pretty clear we're supposed to glorify the Father and the Son. One element that's missing from these five verses that we've looked at is that God glorifies us. In, in Romans 8, he tells us, and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Not only did God sovereignly save us, he has glorified us in Christ with a glory that will reach its completion, its ultimate fulfillment when we're finally home in heaven. Now, if the Godhead returns and reflects glory back to one another, each of whom is absolutely deserving of that glory, how much more so should we return and reflect glory back to God? Each of us is completely undeserving of that glory. We've just been saved by grace. We're just sinners. We haven't earned this. We don't deserve this. And so, seeing that we have been chosen, saved, and glorified, shouldn't we want to find ways to bring glory back to him? And I want to suggest that this passage is a great place to find some of those ways we can do that by looking at how the Father and the Son glorify each other. Now, as they are deity, they might be glorifying each other. They are glorifying each other in some ways that we cannot because we are humans. But we must remember Jesus was also a perfect man. And as such, there are ways that he brought glory to God as a man that we can copy, even though obviously we will do so in a much lesser sense. So we can bring glory to Christ, if we think about some of the ways they did it, by recognizing the authority he's been given. He's been given authority over all of humanity. See, Philippians reminded us that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We don't need to wait for that day. We can do it now. We can recognize his authority. But that's more than just lip service, isn't it? That means we just give our lives to him. We obey him as our Lord. We don't just call him Lord. We live as if he's our Lord. And when we do that... That recognizes his authority, and that brings him glory. Just like Christ obeyed his Father and brought him glory, we obey Christ, and we bring him glory as well. Next, uh, we can receive this eternal life through Christ with praise. If you've been saved, thank him for it. Praise him in your prayers. Recognize how his death for sinners like us reveals his matchless worth and the beauty of his love. We glorify Christ um, when we just praise him for all he's done. We recognize that he's the source of eternal life, and we tell others about it. It's a beautiful way that we can do that. And we, we glorify him for accomplishing the work 
that he came to complete, and we glorify the Father for planning it and sending him. Now, we saw that Jesus brought glory to God by fulfilling the mission he gave him, and we've, we have talked about, and we will see again soon, that he didn't just give Jesus a mission, he gave us a mission as well. A mission to share the gospel across the world. And like Christ, we have to submit to this mission and work in dependence upon God to fulfill it, despite the fact that it's hard. There's a cost that comes with sharing our faith. But we do it to glorify the Father. And as we work on this mission, we glorify God, but something else happens. You see, Christ is glorified by God because God gave him everyone whom Jesus will give eternal life to. We glorify Christ by being his. Now, as we tell others the gospel, working to fulfill this mission, of course we do it in recognition of God's sovereignty over salvation, in our dependence upon the Holy Spirit as we share the gospel with others. As we do that, some people are going to get saved. And those new people who are just newly redeemed will also work to bring glory to their God and Savior so more voices join in the chorus of praise to his glorious name. We magnify and multiply our offering of glory to Christ as we see more people saved and joining in the numbers of the redeemed. Do you see how all these categories of glory flow into one another and all converge in the cross? Our passage shows us how the hour for Christ had come, but it was an hour of glory. It was an hour of triumph. The Father and the Son glorify one another in the work of the cross. And we respond to such a work by glorifying the Father and the Son. Now may God enjoy glory from his redeemed as we reflect upon and act upon what we've been learning about here today in this coming week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we've been delving into a deep subject, the glory that you share with your Son. It is a glory that you've shared with him from eternity past. It is an eternal glory. And Father, it is a glory that is rich and deep and much deserved, and we praise you for it. Father, um, we can only scratch the surface of the glory that is yours and the glory that is Christ's. Father, help us to understand and appreciate a little bit more about that glory. And Father, as we think about it, may it move us to glorify you with our praise, with our singing, with our prayers, with the choices that we make in life, with how we witness to others. May we glorify you, recognize your worth, tell others about how great a God you are. You are the only true God, Father, and we thank you that you are the one that we have the privilege to glorify because you have chosen us. Father, We thank you for the glory that is yours. We seek to just give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.